Hey there, YouTubers. This is Kevin from The Bat Productions. And today we have another House of the Dragon episode. This was episode two from season one of House of the Dragon. And I kind of have my overall thoughts about this. Probably not as good as episode one. I have to admit, probably not quite as good. But we're in the early stages. We're trying to set up stories for the rest of the season. And hopefully for four or five more seasons moving forward. And I think it's doing that. I think it's absolutely building it. But I, I have to say immediately, House of the Dragon, it is House of the Terrible, Terrible Fathers. That's what it should really be called right now. So if you have not seen up to episode two of House of the Dragon, this is gonna be a review video, so it's probably gonna get spoiled for you. You probably shouldn't watch it until you finally finish, because I would be going over the episode and talking about some of the little Easter eggs and some additional background info without giving away too many spoilers. That would be really exciting for you as House of the Dragon fans. All right, so first off, let's kick it off right with the intro. We have the first official theme of Game of Thrones. I mean, I'm sorry, House of the Dragon. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at right now. House of the Dragon, they recycled the actual theme from Game of Thrones, which I wasn't really into. I mean, the intro was, it was the same style. It was a little bit different. Um, you heard like one dragon screech. I'd be totally for the original Game of Thrones theme. If they added some more dragon screeches throughout it, Maybe you heard some like fire crackling or something a little bit more consistently. Something that would have made it stand out from the Game of Thrones intro. I think the producers from HBO are trying to do this thing where this intro is going to be used for all the different shows that they plan on doing. Like maybe it would have been the one for Blood Moon, but that's the show that ended up getting scrapped before House of the Dragon. And they're talking about doing one about Nymeria. They're probably going to use the same theme for that one as well. But I didn't think it was that great. So that was a disappointment. Now, this episode pretty much starts off where we had kind of left off. I mean, Corlys Valerion is just pleading with the king and the rest of the council saying, listen, the Triarchy has taken over the Stepstones. That is one of the, if not the most important shipping route in the entirety of Westeros. So you can understand why a house that is based entirely off of sailing and trading is going to be really concerned about it. And that's what Corlys Valerion is really worried about at this point. But Corlys, he's not being heard at all. And then make it worse, Later on, he ends up helping out the king by offering his daughter into a proposal of marriage. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot of help because Lena Valerian is 12 years old, and the king is decidedly creeped out by that. However, it is a perfect match in many ways, having the Valerians and also the Targaryens, which, by the way, Corlys is already married to Rhaenys Targaryen. So they're already linked together in one way, but this is going to unite the richest and the strongest naval house in the Valerians with Viserys Targaryen's house now that he has to take a wife. So it's a perfect match, but unfortunately, Corlys Valerion is spurned in that regard as well, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. And a huge issue for King Viserys right now, aside from the whole marriage thing is, he has a brother in Daemon Targaryen that has taken Dragonstone, which rightfully belongs to Princess Rhaenyra now. He took a dragon egg from the Dragon Keepers, which is a big old new-new without the permission of the patriarch of the family. He also said he's taken a second wife, and that second wife happens to be a common prostitute. So, a lot of strikes against Damon right now in the eyes of King Viserys and the old council, and they have to go rectify this situation because he can't just take dragon eggs. Now, I do have to give some bonus points here in that King Viserys was actually going to ride to Dragonstone himself and deal with the matter. But Otto Hightower, he stepped up, he said, you know, let me go deal with this. For two reasons. Otto doesn't like Damon very much anyway, and as Hand of the King, it is really wise that King Viserys not be the one to go because Damon's kind of a loose cannon. Otto and his troops go, including the newly appointed Christian Cole to the Kingsguard. They go, they confront Damon. We find out that Damon, yeah, this is a little bit of a cry for help in some ways. Myceria didn't know that she was going to be taken as a wife, and she's not pregnant. So Damon made up a lot of these things, just hoping for some kind of confrontation, some kind of cry out, some attention for his brother and King Viserys, which I thought was very interesting. I think a really fun part is they're about to battle. And Otto's like, oh, you know, you're basically all of you are going to get slaughtered. Then all of a sudden you see Caraxes come out from behind one of the castle spires. Rhaenyra shows up with her dragon, Sarax, and basically diffuses the whole situation. Says, give me back the egg that belonged to my dead brother. And you should probably stop pouting and get the hell out of here because it's my castle. Uh, Damon gave the egg back, but he wasn't going anywhere. And Rhaenyra successfully diffused the situation, but not with the permission of her father. When Rhaenyra returns to King's Landing, they get to have a frank conversation, you know, basically saying, you're the heir, you can't just fly around like that. I value you way too much. And, you know, we got to share his feelings a little bit, and they got to bond over grief of losing the mother, Ama. Now, unfortunately, that's where they get to the discussion about him having to remarry. A little bit earlier on, as I talked about with Horrible Fathers, Corlys Valerion offered up his daughter, Lena Valerion, which makes a lot of sense in many ways. The problem is, she's 12 years old. 
And King Viserys, like I'm sure everyone else who's watching at home, is a little bit creeped out by it. King Viserys actually talks to the rest of his small council. He talks to the Grand Maester and also talks to Otto Hightower as he's dipping his hand in maggots to talk about whether or not Lena Valerion is actually a good match for the king moving forward. Now, both of them say no, which is very interesting. I mean, obviously, Otto Hightower has his own interest as far as the marriage proposal for the king goes. But it was kind of surprising because, honestly, House Valerion has kind of all of it going. Corlys Valerion's a powerful guy. Driftmark is a powerful place. House Valerion, they're of Valyrian descent, just like the Targaryens. So it was kind of weird that they would dismiss it outright. But someone who doesn't have the best interest of the king and is kind of worried about themselves is typically going to do that. Now, remember, even though the Grand Maester is of the Citadel, Grand Maester Pycelle in the main Game of Thrones series was pretty terrible and he gave awful advice. So you can probably expect a little bit more of this. And if you're a little surprised that he's very flawed, you probably shouldn't be. King Viserys, he's got the approval of his daughter Rhaenyra. You know, you got to get in there and you got to marry. And Rhaenyra is very bright. She chose Sir Christian Cole over a bunch of tourney knights because she already knows as a ruler. It's like, listen, you got to make the moves that make sense. And it makes a lot of sense to marry Lena, even though she's 12 years old. However, King Viserys does the, the, the dumbest thing possible in this situation which I'm sure is going to have ripple effects moving forward in the story. Instead, he marries Alicent Hightower, who's definitely been groomed via her father, Otto Hightower, to be the eventual queen of the Seven Kingdoms. So it looks like all those times together playing with the models have actually helped out in getting Alicent intertwined with the Iron Throat, and I'm sure Otto Hightower is ecstatic about it. But the bigger problem is, Corlys Valerion, the owner of the strongest navy in all of Westeros, is not very happy about it. And also, Rhaenyra, your future heir to the Iron Throne, is also not very happy about it because the way King Viserys is, is showing that he cares for Rhaenyra in that sappy moment where saying, like, your mother can never be replaced. I don't even really want to do this. Instead of taking the obvious political move marriage, he wants to smash her best friend. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous. The subtext not only just shows that Alicent and Rhaenyra are best friends, but that they may potentially be lovers. And King Viserys chooses her, chooses Alicent. Like how, could you, like, how could you screw this up anymore? This is horrible. This is Ned Stark level of decision-making, except there's no honor in it. He's just a, a, a moron. No, I won't marry the 12-year-old, but I'll marry the 16-year-old who happens to be my, my daughter's best friend. Yes, yes, this, this, is, this is the right move. Like, it's absolutely, it's maddening how stupid Viserys has been. That's why I'm calling this the house of the terrible dads right now. Because Otto Hightower is a terrible dad for sending his daughter to be groomed into basically hooking up with King Viserys. Corliss is offering his 12-year-old daughter to the king. Ugh. And King Viserys is being a terrible father to Rhaenyra by hooking up with his best friend. <laughs> you have Damon, who's not even a father, but is pretending to be a father and stealing eggs. Like, they all suck. Every one of them this episode. They all suck. Probably the most redemptive scene in the entire episode was actually the scene between Rhaenys and Rhaenyra. Rhaenys is definitely kind of the behind-the-scenes wise person that is not Elena Tyrell, but she's having those dialogues that remind you of Elena Tyrell, where there's a lot of wisdom that's being dropped, but there are some times where clearly her agenda is shining through. Like her speech with Rhaenyra talking about, like, listen, I, the, the realm's never going to accept a female leader. I've been there at Council of 101. They passed me over, even though I probably should have been the one that was chosen. And it's going to happen to you too. And Rhaenyra's not really listening. Like she is, but she, you know, she's defending because she's a strong lady and she's trying to defend it. But Rhaenys is trying to drop some knowledge on her and she's just not going for it. But I thought it was brilliant dialogue. Rhaenys is clearly the character that I think we have to look forward to moving forward and seeing some of the, the wonderful wisdom nuggets that she's going to drop. And to the end of the episode, now that King Viserys has ruined everything, Corlys Valerion goes back to Driftmark and he invites an old friend, Daemon Targaryen, to come and talk with him about the future and what that looks like. Basically, Corlys is so spurned at this point and he needs his trade routes to be protected. He reaches out to Daemon Targaryen himself, who has holed up at Dragonstone with his gold cloaks and said, listen, we got to take on the Triarchy and the Crab Feeder, as he is known. We, he's basically just a pirate from the Triarchy. He's killing Westerosi sailors in the area, then basically nailing them to board so that crabs can eat them alive. It's pretty hardcore, but it's also a little less threatening when the person in question happens to look like Tim Curry mixed with Sebulba from Star Wars. Very interesting choice to make the Crab Feeder look like that, I have to admit. I'm not sure I hate it yet, but we'll see. But that's kind of a quick summary of the episode. I think we have a lot coming up. I mean, if you see the preview for the next episode, it looks like we're going to jump into the future where King Viserys already has a child. So that'll be really 
fun. We're also going to see the battle for the Stepstones, which is great. And that's how the episode pretty much ended off. If I had to give it a score, episode one, I give it eight and a half, which I thought was an amazing first episode. For this one, I'll probably give it like a seven because I thought it was slow. I think it did move the story forward, but I think it was just more disappointed. Like turn after turn after turn, I was like, my God, you all suck at doing this. Otto Hightower is getting everything he wants, but terrible father. Corliss isn't even good at being a terrible father and giving away his daughter. And then you have King Viserys, who's making every wrong decision, despite being, a, he honestly seems like a nice fellow. Seeing Rhaenyra on Dragonback, it was awesome seeing Caraxes. It was awesome seeing Damon point his sword at Otto Hightower. There were a lot of cool, like, little snippets of things, but I can't wait till we get a few more episodes in, and hopefully they've written it so well that they round out all of these pieces into a really, really, really good first season. So that's my review of the episode. What did you think of this? Did you think it was a little bit better or worse than what I did? Was there a more standout scene than Rainey's and Rhaenyra talking? Let me know down below in the comment section. I would love to hear from you. Also, if you want to read the Fire and Blood book, that is, this is all based off of entirely from House of the Dragon, you can listen to this audiobook that I've been narrating for the past year and a half or so. I've only got four chapters left, so soon it will be finished, which would be really exciting. Uh, but I've actually loved doing this project here, and I think you'll like it too if you give it a shot. Also hit that subscribe button because I have a goal right now to get to 50,000 subscribers which is absolutely massive. I need to rally the Batterman so we can get there by the end of House of the Dragon season one. It is a lofty goal, but I do believe that you can help me get there in a big way. And also nobody claimed this Cal Drogo Funko Pop figure. I don't know how that's possible. So we're moving on. We're going to pick two new winners. I'm going to put those names in my next House of the Dragon video that should be coming up in the next couple days. So please be on the lookout for that. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day, everybody. You take care and goodbye.